makes the difference When he speaks He relieves my troubled mind It's the only voice I hear That makes the difference And I'll find it one day Oh, his voice gently gives me my direction, and I'll follow that voice that I hear. His voice. Good night, Melody. God bless you. Thank you for joining tonight. When he speaks, tell a friend to put his arm. Randy Chandra Paul, good night everybody. Leslie Paul, good night, good night. How is Honey? Honey, how is Leslie? Oh, his voice, it's a strong and a mighty tower. Tearing down every stronghold in my life. He's the master of the wind and the sea that rages. When he speaks, all my darkness turns to light. I have heard other voices speaking to me. To deceive and to lead me astray. Oh, but my shepherd's voice is different from all than all others. And the night is the Michel Thompson, Michel Haynes, all the missions are on to it. My mission, Mish. His voice makes a difference. When he speaks, he relieves my trouble. It's the only that makes a difference. And yeah, I good evening. Shan Shan William. Oh, yes, his voice makes the difference. When he speaks, he relieves my troubled mind. It's the only voice I hear that makes the difference. And I'll follow one day at a time. Bobby, Bobby. We're in quarantine, man. Help my brother out. Send a helicopter. <laughs> and I'll follow one day at a time. Good to be home, though. Good to be back in Canada. That was Jimmy Swaggart singing his voice makes the difference. Let's have another song before we get into the word. Donna Bacon, good night. Avery Duncan, good night. Samin Singh, good night. Jesus, I'll never forget. Janine Dion, good night. Buenas noches, mi amiga. Como, como, como. Jesus, I'll never forget how you said how you set me free. Jesus, no, I'll never forget. I'll never forget how you brought, how you brought me up. Yeah. Jesus, Caleb I'll Wilson, 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 Lynette Boudin, no good night, good night. Compton and Lynette. <laughs> you work, faith over fear. Good night, Pastor, Pastor Debbie. Write it down, faith over fear. Let's get going, faith over fear. Even set me free. First Kings 11. 23 and 24. First Kings chapter 11. Verses 23 and 24. Faith over fear. Let's get going with the mantra tonight. We choose faith over fear. Good evening, 
Sandra Baru Roberts. God bless you. Glad you joined us tonight. Force Kings 11, 23 and 24. Let's get going. Faith over fear. Write that down on the page here. Faith over fear. We are getting the spam out of our brain, downloading a different atmosphere. There you go. Kenneth Thomas, good night. Angeline Abraham, good night. Faith over fear. Yeah, that's a different fear. F E A R is the fear we're talking about. That fear means you're light skinned. <laughs> These phones are smart. They do whatever they want to do. F E A R. F E A R. Faith over F E A R. Somebody got faith over faith. <laughs> F E A R. F E A R. Fear. That's the other fear. That fear is light skinned. This fear. That's to do with an emotion, F-E-A-R, that's the fear we're talking about today. You want to be on the same page? Let's get going with this. Chan Chan Williams, faith over fear, that's the way you spell fear. F-E-A-R, F-E-I-R is one, F-A-R-E is another one. We talk about F-E-A-R. Raquel Lambert, how you doing girl? Good night. Faith over fear, get that thing going there girl. I know you're not accustomed to hearing about faith over fear, but what can I say? <laughs> Glory to God. Let's see if we got another song that can bless us. Oh, there you go. That's the one right there. That's it. That's it. Donna Bacon, you got F A E R, F E A R. The phones do what they like. And that the nerve to call themselves smartphones. In meekness by Galilee Shore. All right. First Kings 11, 23, and 24 is where we are dropping off from. One soul. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Jesus. He is my friend, true to the end. He gave himself. Precious Gem Francis, Faith over fear, Harvey Peters, Faith over fear, Faith over fear. First King, that's right, 11, 23, and 24. I like the way you're ahead of the curve, Raquel. You're not playing with this thing at all. Come ready for them, I say, ready for them, them, them. <laughs> Glory to God. Sometimes life can put you in a place to where there is no friend left but Jesus. He knelt in Gethsemane that day, not for the strong, but for the weak. And there he cried. You see, he's the light of the world, and yet, I hear you, I hear you. Millie, Millie, Millie Nyman. Faith over fear, girl. Write that down right there. Let's all get on the same page. Brenda Charles. Buenos noches. Como esta? How is Anguilla going? 
wonderful You got this stuff together, yes or yes? <laughs> you only got two options. everybody. First Kings 11 chapter, the 23rd and 24th verse is what I'm using tonight as my foundational scripture, the foundation, the bottom of the building upon which everything is going to be laid. So it has to be something solid so that the building does not crack and collapse. You have to have a strong, sure foundation. Nothing is stronger than the word of God. His words, they are forever settled in heaven. When we start these programs, we write on, on the th little thing there on our page, Faith Over Fear, F-E-A-R. We want to all be in, the, in one mind. In the same way, F-E-A-R, Debbie. F-A-I-R means your fair skin. You're talking about complexion, something like that. F-E-A-R is the fear, like fear of God, fear of dogs, whatever. F-A-R-E, you paid the fear, you paid the money to get to your destination. So there's F-A-R-E, F-E-A-R, and F-A-I-R. We are talking about F-E-A-R. And sometimes you write these things and the phone decides to do whatever it wants to do. Faith, F-A-I-T-H. That faith is another kind of faith. So, you know, you get these words that sound similar. They can trip you up on the phones, of course, with their smart self. They want to spell for you and put the thing up there on the phone and you got to keep correcting stuff. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verses 23 and 24. And God stirred him up another adversary. What? God can stir up adversaries against you? Oh, yes. Rizon, the son of Eliada, which fled from his lord Hadezer, king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him. That's the key. In what we're talking about tonight. He gathered men unto him. Good night, Martha Collimore. And became captain over a band. A band of the men that he gathered unto him. When David slew them of Zobah as they went to Damascus. The capital of Syria. The same Syria with Bashir al-Assad. And dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. He gathered men unto himself and became captain over a band. Now, last night I did three, yesterday I did three messages. And I changed my garments three times. Because what happens when people see you in the same thing, like, like say tonight I'm wearing this white uh, jacket. If I were to do another teaching or three teachings tonight, people assume because they see the white jacket, it's the one message. So they don't go to number two and number three. And so you need to change so that, okay, that's not the same clothes. It's got to be an, a different message so that you can keep ahead of the curve and people will not miss out on vital links. What I do is systematic teaching. One is linked to the next. I will start a teaching on favor. Then the next time I'll continue. Then the next time I'll continue. But if I wear the same clothes and do the same teaching, people think it's the same thing. So you need to switch up to differentiate that, oh, this is something totally different. Or you write on it part one, part two, part three. But even then I find people don't look at part one, two, and three. They look at the clothes you wear and they assume 
that uh, you're not doing anything different. So that's why I switch and change. All right. And uh, I was talking about leadership last night and talking about the fact that there is a, a kind of leadership that is not, is not the best and there's another kind of leadership that's good. I give 15 points on the not so good leader and 18 on the good one. Then I give you some hints and insights as to what to do so that you can rise to that level of becoming a good leader. Now tonight there are some of the things that I'm going to be talking about in leadership and dealing with people. If you're going to lead people, there are some things that you have to know. You cannot be a bull in a china shop. You're going to offend people. And instead of leading them, you'll be driving them away from you. So tonight I'm talking about our people's skills. <clears throat> and let me say, we are all in, in the making with regard to our people's skills because there's always something that you can work out on, that you can you know, get, get better, that you can improve upon. But in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, Rezon, the son of Eliada, the Bible says, he gathered men unto him and became a captain over a band. Now this man, Rezon, became a leader in his time, in his day. And the book, the Bible tells us, that he gathered people unto himself. He became a leader, but what did he do? He gathered people unto himself. Every true leader is able to rally a team of people around himself, around herself. Jesus himself gathered 12 people around him. One of them was a hypocrite, but hey, what else is new? He lived with them and fellowship with them for three and a half years. You and I have to decide to be a gathering point. And whatever is offensive and might scatter people that's operating in our personality, it must be dealt with if we are going to take leadership seriously. Learn how to speak and act and behave without scattering people. Now understand that some people are very petty and easily offended, particularly in this day and time when everything offends everybody. But you still have to try your best to not be the reason for offense. Now while saying that, I'm going to tell you bluntly, you're still going to offend people. Because no matter what you do, there's always some little egg out there that is easily offended and if you dress a certain way, look a certain way, smile, park in a certain spot, you don't know what it is that causes offense. But today's people in and out of church, in the secular and the religious community, are the pettiest people on the planet ever in the history of mankind. And so no matter what you do, your people are going to be offended. But you have to learn how to speak and act without scattering and trying not to cause offense. Are you feeling a brother? Now I'm working on that because I have a very in-your-face, blunt way of telling, shooting straight. And uh, people can't, people, oh, no, Rev, no, Rev, you can't say it like that. You know, you, you've got to be nicer to me. And, and they're doing something that's getting me to die earlier than I should die. And I'm trying to tell them, don't smoke your cigarette in my van, in my car. And they get offended with that. Well, so sometimes you're going to cause offense even when you don't mean to offend people. And what I have found in the last couple of, of uh, weeks, you can't talk about politics at all. You will offend people no matter what you do. They think you're on this party, that party. So you've got you've to just stay away from it forever. If, if you're not going to offend, then that's one area you don't talk about that. Just leave that alone. Go to the voting booth and vote your thing and go home. Let me give you some steps in rallying people around you. Number one, it doesn't mean it's in order of priority. When I say number one, I do not mean this is the most important point. Number one, you got to start somewhere. Make people feel that you really want them around you. Make them feel that, that you want them around you. Don't give them the stink eye when they come. Don't stop the conversation when they come. They will feel like <coughs> you are talking about them and uh, they don't feel wanted. You have to make people feel that you really want them around you. You have to go out of your way to make people feel accepted. All kinds of people. Some of you only got Indian friends. Some of you only got black friends. Some of you only got white friends. What's up with that? 
And you have no intentions of changing either. You're just like your own people. That's not going to fly. If you're going to be a leader, you're going to lead all kinds of people. And you have to be aware of their quirks and uh, do your best to make them feel like you want them around. Number two, when they come around, appreciate the people that are around you. Rejoice with people around you over their little success, over their little breakthroughs. Their joy will increase when they feel that another person is rejoicing with them. People buy a car. Don't get offended and, and you know, you got another car. What is none of your business? <clears throat> Just enjoy the man's car. Oh, why would you buy a black car? He likes black. Enjoy the black. Tell him it looks executive. Learn to appreciate the things that people appreciate and stop. If it were me, I would buy a golden color. Well, it's not you. Just enjoy the man's black car. Tell him he has a great choice to pick a car that black and, you know, he's going to look like an executive as he goes around in his sleek ride. Appreciate the people around you. Their joy will increase when they feel that another person is rejoicing with them. When they succeed, rejoice with them. Make a fuss over it. God knows people have done, uh, they have climbed mountains to get across some things and to get some things done. And don't, don't spit on their parade. Don't rain on their parade. Don't pee on them and tell them it's raining. Come on now. Number three. Admire their homes, their furniture, their clothes, their houses, their cars. Because it represents their choice. It represents their achievements. If you admire and respect people's choices and achievements, you are admiring them personally. They will naturally warm up to you. Don't come and tell me that you don't like white shoes when I'm wearing white shoes. I like white shoes. I just happen to like white shoes. Tell me I, I have great choice in, in, in buying a white shoes. I always have a pair of white shoes tucked away somewhere. I know it's not the shoe that people wear, but hey, a brother likes his white shoes. Just tell me I have great choice in picking a white shoes. Don't be mad at my shoes. What you're telling me is that I don't have choice. I don't make great choices. You don't respect my choice. You don't admire my choice. Come on now. Glory to God. <laughs> oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Genuinely admire people's choice in cars, in houses, in furniture, in clothes, in cologne, in shoes, in gold, in silver, in diamonds. Let them know they're doing all right. Let them know you like their style. Come on. I remember this was a lesson for me. I was in a church and a, a, a brother from Africa was the speaker. And they had made a big fuss about him that he was this great general, blah, blah. And uh, somebody was behaving real obnoxious in the service. I turned around and looked at that man and he wouldn't stop. He was a disturbance. He was, he was, uh, he was nasty in his behavior. He was loud. He was petty. He was childish. He was creating quite a disturbance. And even when the preacher got the microphone to, to do his message, the man wouldn't stop. So I thought to myself, some usher will come and grab him and take him out of the building. Nobody did. Finally, the preacher got the attention of the audience and he started his prayer and the man wouldn't stop. And he looked at the brother. The preacher looked at the man who was disturbing the service. He looked at him from head to toe. And he said, my God. I love your shoes. Your shoes has attitude. And he laughed and the crowd laughed. And that man never disturbed that service again. I thought to myself, what just happened? He had every reason to be angry. He had every reason to be offended. He had every reason to be upset. But instead of escalating the thing, he told the man about his shoes with attitude. And I thought, wow, I better learn from that. Next thing you know, I googled the man, the man, the preacher that said this guy has shoes with attitude. The man is in the Guinness Book of World Records for amassing the largest crowd in the history of humanity from Adam to now. And I thought to myself, whoa, no wonder he's got that kind of crowd coming to his services when he's out preaching in the open air. He has the knack to de-escalate situation, to praise people who are behaving obnoxious. I've got to learn that skill. Oh, yes, yes. Admire people's stuff. Admire what they, what they drive. Admire their clothes. Admire, admire, admire. And say it out loud. 
Man, you got shoes with attitude. <laughs> Glory to God. They will naturally warm up to you when you genuinely admire what they, what they chose. Number four, show people that you respect them. No matter who they are and what they have or don't have. People will warm up to you once they know you respect them. In this world, many people are not respected. In the church too, generally speaking. Black people are the most disrespected people on the planet. And I'm telling the truth right there. Everybody else gets a pass, but they look at us suspiciously from get-go. Or they start to tell you about some black friend that they have. As if that would get them off the hook and make you warm up to them. Don't tell me about no black friend that you have when I'm the only black man in the room. I don't want to hear that. That is offensive to me. You're not warming up there to me. Uh, a lot of people don't respect Africans. And some tribes are particularly despised and hated. And people are looking for someone who genuinely respects them in spite of where they came from, in spite of who they are, in spite of how much money they have. Anyone who has the ability to respect people, no matter who they are, will have people rallying around them. You cannot disrespect people and expect them to rally around you. You cannot disrespect people. And uh, the church is very guilty uh, number one, the church disrespects women by and large. And number two, the church has a very uh, suspicious view of people that are poor. If they don't have a lot of money, the church doesn't have much use for them. And they are treated a certain way. And women always get the, the short end of the stick. The men can do every kind of wickedness. And the pastor will tell the wife, forgive him and move on. But you let that woman do something wrong or let them hear or suspect she's doing something wrong. And then they'll bring the thunder and the lightning. Why? Because they have very little respect for women. They see them as the means of frying chicken for the bishop, raising money for the church. And then they kind of push them aside when major decisions are made. They just get the men to have a say. Women have no say. You have to show people that you respect them no matter who they are or what they have. As a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, you can't just suck up to the rich and spit on the poor. You have to have people in all cross-sections of society. Respect is currency. Respect is currency. Respect is currency. Oh, glory to God. That's Von de G right there. Number five. I'm telling you how to rally people around you and how to lead. Because if, you, if nobody's following you, you're not leading. You're just going for a stroll. <laughs> Number five, now pay attention to this. Be conscious of people who have inferiority complexes and treat them very carefully. Now, when I was growing up, I'm still growing up, we had this thing that we would do in rubbing each other. Deliberately, we'll go out of our way to rub somebody the wrong way. It's almost like a roast. You insult them, kind of, sort of. You don't really mean it but you insult them. But over time, you find that some people couldn't take the insult, especially if you insulted them about their mother. Those are fighting words now. They'll start crying and tell you, don't tell, don't tell me about my mother. And you were just joking around, but you hit a sore spot and people are offended. Look, whatever offends people, don't say it again. Stop that. Cut it out. If you know a name offends them, don't call them that name. Are you feeling it, brother? Be conscious of people who have inferiority complex and treat them very carefully. Tantalize. Tantalize. That's what we call it. We tantalize in each other. Well, this generation doesn't know about tantalize and they can't take much of anything. So, respect is currency. Be conscious of people's inferiority complexes and treat them very carefully. Kid gloves. Kid gloves. Because you're trying to rally people around you. are not trying to insult people. Number six. Never tease somebody who does not like to be teased. Now some of us can take it. Over the years, because of church now. I was a wimp when I started going to church 40 plus years ago. I was wimpy. I could handle certain stuff. But when people got real, you know, they started to dig under your skin. 
my nose will start to flare, my anger will start to get, uh, you know, boil, and I, I might just have to bring some, some punches up in here. Never tease someone who does not like to be teased. If people can't stand to tantalize, don't tantalize. There are some people who hate being teased. And often this is because of a complex they have from childhood. Don't make jokes about stuff that you know offends them. Leave it alone. Don't bring up that conversation. You know something is, is not good. It doesn't uh, make them feel happy. Don't bring it up. Don't remind them of the time this and the time that. Stop that. Don't tease people that can't handle being teased. Yeah, but now, over the years, church has rubbed me so often that it doesn't bother me anymore. Nothing bothers me anymore. People praising me doesn't give me the big head. People insulting me doesn't make me feel bad. Nobody is going to spoil my day. The only person who can spoil my day is me. I have to decide to spoil my day. Nothing you do, nothing you say can spoil my day. Ever. I'm done with that. Even keel, equilibrium, balance. Roll with the punches. Roll with the punches. Roll with the punches. Tough skin. Tough exterior. Tough. I thought I was tough. Then I came to Canada. And boy, oh boy, oh boy. They threw me in a blender and turned the heat up a thousand degrees. And I was roasted and toasted every which way but south. That's when I learned, boy, you, need, you got some toughening up to do. <laughs> and one lady even came to me and told me, she said, listen to me now. Put on your leather jacket and get ready for some lashes. I thought, what is she talking about? They were planning to put a song beating. And boy, when the first lash hit me, I was so shocked. I stood up there for half an hour like, what happened? I'm a nice guy. And then the second lash. Then I decided, hey, it's time to dodge. <laughs> and take some more lashes. Now my skin is tough. I can handle anything. Number seven. Call people by their name. After you have met them. I used to be with an organization, a religious organization, and they always call me Brother Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. And uh, nothing that I did could get them to call me by my right name. I, I, I took it as an insult. I'm telling you, my name is spelled with one L, C-O-L-I-N, and they would insist on writing C-O-L-L-I-N-S. And they, they wouldn't stop it. They would not stop it. They'd send letters to me in that name. And for all the time I was in that organization, they did it over. It looked like they just decided, I don't care what you tell us your name is. We will call you what we want to call you. It was very insulting. Call people by the right name. No one likes to feel like they're a mere number. People will warm up to you when they realize that you know them by name. They will even be more touched if you call them by their name. This person knows me. They recognize my name. Somebody graduates and qualifies in a thing and they have a doctor in front of their name, call them doc. They're a lawyer, you call them counsel. You show respect. That, you, know, you don't know how much time and energy the people spend to get to that place. Just show respect for people's office. Don't call them by their first name like you know them like that. Stop that. Show respect. Show regard. Honor to whom honor is due. When people call me by my first name, they get, they get called in. And they don't like calling at all. And they say, well, what happened, Rev? As if you want Rev, you'll get Rev. If, you know, if you, if you want Colin, you'll get Colin. He's not a nice guy. <laughs> he said, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, is in boom, is in boom, is in boom, boom shakalaka, all that kind of stuff. Just call a brother by his name. You know my name. Don't call me in the boom. I'm not in the boom. Ask me how to pronounce my name. I'll tell you. You get it from the horse's mouth. Call people by their names. Don't call them by a false name. Don't call them by how you think it sounds and stuff like that. It's very insulting. Number eight. Show interest in people's personal lives. Ask about their homes, their job, their school, their children. People need to feel that the leader has a genuine interest in their lives. Now I've got a granddaughter. Ask me how my granddaughter is doing. I would light up like a Christmas tree. I can talk about her all the time. Oh yeah, she's smart, she's this, she's that. You know, I feel proud to have this little, this little girl in my life now. 
And you know I have a granddaughter. You're not asking about her. What's up with you? Don't you have any respect? <laughs> Whatever is important to people, show interest in their personal life. You ask me about my granddaughter, man, you and I are friends for life. You don't ask me. I'm looking at you suspicious, like you have no regard for my grandfather, Ness. <laughs> I'm just playing with you, but ask me about her anyhow. Show interest in people's personal life. Don't talk about yourself all the time. Number nine. Show interest in their aspirations, in their visions, in their goals. When you're only interested in your vision, your goal, people will silently withdraw from you. When they sense that you have an interest in making them successful, they will rally around you. In one church, my wife and I, we sent 13 people to the university. Yes, let me say it now. My wife and I, we sent 13 people to the university. Oh, I'm saying some things now that you will never know had I not just said it. 13. And one of them is thankful. The other 12, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Show an interest in people's aspirations, in their visions, in their goals. Show interest. Ask about it. How are you doing with this thing? What can I do to help? Is there any book you need? What can I do? Can I give you a ride somewhere? You need me to drop off a meal sometime. Ask about what people are doing. Yeah, I'm a proud grandpa. Yes and yes. Number 10. Offer food and drinks to visitors whenever you can. Offer food and drinks to people whenever you can. Oh, glory to God. You know, my grandmother had a way of cooking more food than we could eat. We were not rich, but she never cooked exactly for six people or seven people or however many people were in the house. She would cook extra. She said, you never know who would drop by. And guess what? The news got out that Mrs. Bainu had extra food and she always cooked extra. And if people were hungry, no matter where they were, they would find their way to her house and they would come around 12 o'clock and knock on the door. And they would say, I was just passing by, knowing fully well that within five minutes, there'll be a, a plate of food in their hand and, and she could cook, she could throw down. All of a sudden, that house became like a rallying point. It's like a big yard. Everybody's coming there, dropping in, dropping in. It is not that they were greedy people, but just the fact that you know that if you're hungry, something is always, she always had something stashed somewhere. All these little hiding places. But within a minute, if somebody visited, they had something in their hand to eat. They had something in their hand to drink. And people love that. People come to your house. I've gone to some places and preached until I got laryngitis. They wouldn't even give you a glass of water, nothing. Pat you on the back and say, good sermon, Rev. See you tomorrow night. These people are mean as a junkyard dog. And then they wonder why you don't go back. I'm not glutton for punishment. <laughs> Woo -wee. Oh, Deborah Allison Forbes asking, how's my granddaughter doing in, in, oh, she's so fine, like vintage wine. She's smart, she's bright. Today she asks for uh, a bar, nah, nah. Her tongue is loosing and she's beginning to talk. I'm so proud of her. She's the best thing the Lord ever made. <laughs> I know y'all are teasing me. I'm teasing you right back. Offer food and drinks to visitors whenever they can, whenever you can. This makes your home feel like a rallying point, a natural rallying point. Learn to offer food and drinks to people whenever they come. And if they say no, they don't want it, get a doggy bag ready to give it to them when they go home. Oh, yes. I'm an expert at pastry. Any kind you want, I can make it for you. And every now and then I feel uh, my inner baker and I all stirring up. And I just lay out some stuff and get it going there. And as soon as people come in, before they can sit down, my wife will say, oh, can't wait, wait until they sit. At least wait until they sit. While they're walking in, I'm there. <laughs> I love you. Do I look hungry to you, Rev? No, no, but I just love doing it. 
And I love people with a healthy appetite too. I don't like these people pinching penny pinching stuff. Come on now. You're making me look bad here like my stuff doesn't taste good. I know it tastes good. Eat. <laughs> Offer people food and drinks whenever you can. If they're fasting, that's another story. But if they're always fasting, tell them don't come back to your house. Why are you always fasting when you come here? Name of Jesus. Number 11. Listen to people's problems. People are going to have problems. Learn the art of listening. When you allow people to talk about themselves, they feel psychologically, they feel closer to you. And this makes them rally around you. And for God's sake, keep people's secrets. Don't be gossiping. People tell you something in confidence. You, This is CNN. On the news today, you are in the Situation Room and this is Wolf Blitzer. Stop that. People tell you something in confidence, you keep that thing until you die. Don't tell anybody. Oh, rock a shocker now. Number 12. Listen to people's problems. People need a listening ear in today's world where trouble look. Trouble is on everybody's door. It's in everybody's life. And most of us, we are too busy to listen to people. One of the things I hear when people commit suicide is they say, you know, he looked so happy yesterday. Nobody took the time to listen. Nobody took the time to listen. Listen to people's problems. Listen. Don't, you know, don't interrupt them. Let them talk. Give them a listening ear. If you can't lend them money, lend them a listening ear. At least you can lend them something. Number 12. Let the conversation center around other people and what they are doing rather than on you and what you are doing. Let the conversation center on them. It is vain to have a self-centered conversation. If your conversation is always about you, your achievement, your vision, people get tired of listening to you and move away. They'll say you think you're all of that in a bag of chips and a Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> number 13 <laughs> number 13 <laughs> be an encourager always notice when somebody has made an effort to achieve something and encourage them perhaps they sang a song they did a new hairstyle they wore a new dress they wore a flashy nice shoe there's no need to say you don't like what they did keep that to yourself all you need to do is notice the effort and appreciate it Oh my goodness, you have shoes with attitude. He won that man over and stopped all of his nonsense. Oh, glory to God. Be an encourager. Toxic people, I don't like them around me too much. Because they're always raining on your parade. They always have something negative, some negative perspective. Be an encourager for God's sake, man. If I think it can be done, don't tell me it cannot be done. If I listen to people, I'll stuck, be stuck in South America until the 1st of uh, May. But I told them, if, one, if two people are going to get out, I'm one of them. And here I am. Three airports shut. And I made it through all three of those airports. Nothing is impossible to them that believe. Be an encourager. Always have a word of inspiration. Always have a word of cheer. Always have a humorous thing to make people laugh. The, the world is stressful and toxic as it is. I said on my page today, don't send me nothing about no corona. I don't want to hear about corona no more. Enough. I have had enough. My brain is swamped. I'm overwhelmed with corona, corona, corona. Send me something about Christ. Send me something about the miracle power of God. Send me something about your granddaughter. Send me a picture of your grandson. We might make a match from now. Name of Jesus. <laughs> Woo! It's almost like it's a zombie-like state of trance and hypnosis. They're hypnotizing and brainwashing with all this over and over and over. There. Enough! I don't want to hear nothing more about COVID-19. Tell me about COVID-20. Name of Jesus. Be an encourager. Are you there? Number 14. Say thanks for everything. It is better for people to think you're saying thanks too often than for them to feel that you're an ingrate and ungrateful wretch and nimakaram. <laughs> ah, say thanks for everything. Nothing is small. You don't know the effort that people took. You don't know how much money they had when they went and bought you that gift. You don't know. Say thanks for everything. 
Glory to God. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very kindly. Thank you, thank you. Great job. You did a good job. Good to be here. God bless you. People don't have to bother with you. They don't have to entertain you. They, they have a life too. They're busy. And for them to take their time off to accommodate you, that's a blessing, man. Come on now. Glory to God. Say thank you for everything. Mind your manners, don't forget. <laughs> There's a song that goes like that. Number 15. Smile. Yeah, people gravitate around smiling and friendly people. We know that we are not perfect and they are not perfect. But we don't need to be stern and have a face like a frowning policeman. Frowning people remind us of our failings. People need someone to encourage them that in spite of their failings, they are accepted. So smile. Smile a while and give your face a rest. Wave your hands to the one who loves the best. Then shake hands with those nearby and give to them a smile. We used to go to Sunday school. Brother Stapleton, Walter Stapleton, he started Sunday school with that song. You look around and shake hands. It just lightened up the atmosphere and made it ready and ripe for, for stuff to, to start happening up in here. Smile. Smile. Smile a lot. People don't like a sour puss around them. Smile. Amen and amen. Number 16. Do not be partial. One of the first things that people notice about leaders is when they are partial. There are certain pastors who give certain members an hour of their time. And when other people come to see them, they are rushing them away because they don't want them there. Because they see that person as too poverty stricken to be sitting in my office and me talking to them for an hour. They are a bad investment. They can't give anything to the church and I don't want them around here. And people notice that pastors have favorites. The rich in particular, they, they suck up to the rich and they pray for them longer. They, they, they hug them, they talk to them, they make a beeline to shake their hand. They go to their car and see them off. But the poor, they want nothing to do with them. Ministers, you ministers of God, don't think the people are not paying attention. They notice you. They know you have favorites. They know you can't stand them. They know you don't like them. They feel it in your handshake, the quick handshake, and you dust your hand and wipe it off as if they got some yaws or something. Oh, it's getting hot up in here. Do not be partial. James 3 and 17, you read that scripture. Marinate on that. The wisdom of this world is full of partiality, but the wisdom that is from above is without partiality. The wisdom from above is without partiality. The wisdom from above is is without partiality. The wisdom from above is without partiality. There are places that you and I can go. And you sense when you get in there that the people don't want you around. You, there's, a, there's a tension in the atmosphere. You could cut it with a knife. You feel the rejection. You see the stink eye, the posture, the facial expression. Everything is telling you, we don't want you here. And what do you do? You make an exit. Don't go where you're tolerated. Go where you are appreciated. Name of Jesus. Don't be glutton for punishment. Even little children notice when their parents are partial towards another child. Mommy like him more than me. Daddy like him more than me. No one wants to follow someone who's biased and partisan without a cause. And some people have a, a, a way of putting you in their bad book. <clears throat> they want to run a country, but they're putting you in a bad book. It is difficult to live in a country where the head of state dislikes you because of unsubstantiated tales. It is difficult to work in an organization where the boss can begin to dislike you based on a new feeling that he has. There are some of the smaller islands that I've gone to in the Caribbean, and you have a sense from the airport that they don't want you around. They despise you. They can't stand you. They don't like you. People are in those countries working themselves to the bone, working like a dog. They would not give them status in that country, always threatening to put them out of the country paying them later than they should be paid, not paying them, threatening them, trying to rape them, trying to hurt them, trying to hurt their children. Non-belongers over in this line, belongers in this line over here. From the time you touch down in that country, you are feeling the hate coming at you. No wonder God didn't give them a bigger country because the small one they have and they are so pompous with themselves. 
I was in a country I would not name right now. And this uh, brother, Caucasian brother, came over to me. He said, I noticed that you're a stranger here. I said, yes. Yeah. He said, where are you from? I was living in Guyana at the time. I told him I'm from Guyana. You know what that man told me? And I was in church and I was a minister, an ordained minister in that organization. You know what that man told me? Try not to try to hide and stay in my country. Well, I took offense. I asked him, what makes you think I want to stay here? He said, there are many people from your country that are here and we don't want them here. I said, I'm not one of them. I don't want to be here. With an obnoxious man like you, I don't want to be in your country. The quickest flight out, I will leave. And it so happened, it happened, it happened just like what I said, because the two major players in the conference got in a fight, got in an altercation, and uh, they were arguing with each other in the public space in this fancy hotel where James Bond made a movie. Yes, yes. And I thought to myself, I don't need to be here. Four or five thousand people in the audience is split half on this guy's side, half on that guy's side. I took the next flight out to Miami. And from there to Washington, and from there to New York, and from then to now, the rest is history. There's a lot of partiality in the church. There are a lot of partiality in nations. And the same nations that don't want you in their country, they go to St. Thomas and, and uh, Puerto Rico for their children to be born as American citizens. But you can be born in their country. You have to go to your country and get a birth certificate. And they will treat you like absolute rubbish in that country. I don't know how people can live in places that people don't want them around. I can't stay in a place. The minute I sense that people don't want me around, I'm out of there and I ain't going back. I don't need the drama. I don't need the grief. You're not going to have to tell me twice not to come. You just have to look like you don't want me around and I'm gone. The wisdom from above is without partiality. How can you be a preacher and you only like the rich members in the church? You spend all the time with them. You talk to them lovingly and kindly. You never have a kind word for the poor brother and for the widow and for the poor sister and for the young college uh, person there who's having a hard time with finances. I know of umpteen cases where preachers just suck up to the rich people in the church and they treat the poor ones like crap. Oh, yes. No one wants to follow anybody that's partisan and biased. It is difficult to work in an organization where the boss dislikes you based on a new feeling that he has, based on your blackness, based on your polka dottedness, based on your brownness, based on your Indianness, based on your Amerindian Portuguese-ness, based on your suit, whatever. The wisdom from above is without partiality. I'm talking to pastors now. Don't think people don't notice that you're always up in the rich people's face in the church and that you have a lot of time for them, but you have no time for them. Don't think they don't notice. Don't think they don't notice that the men can commit 47 adultery and, and the pastor will say to the wife, forgive him and move on with your life. But if, if there's a rumor about that woman, she hasn't done anything. If there's a rumor about that woman, they come down on her like a ton of bricks and call her every prostitute known to man. There's a patriarchal spirit that's in the church that needs to die where men can do whatever the hell they like and get off with it and they would fight the women down and treat them like a piece of crap. It's one of the things I can't stand about religion is their hatred of women. Oh, don't get me started on that right now. I feel the heckle in my jekyll. I better calm down, calm down, calm down. Fit over fear, fit over fear. <laughs> Number 17. Whenever there's an opportunity, give a gift. A gift makes room for a man. A man's gift make it room for him and bring him in the presence of great men. Proverbs 18 and 16. It does mean a gift both ways. I was in a country and every time I went to that country, I'm giving a testimony now. Every time I went to that country, I would take a piece of jewelry to the head man in the country. Some gold ring, some gold chain, some gold something, something, something. And one year, I was preaching real loud. And they had a, 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 an amplifier that was very powerful. And somebody in the community called the police. And the police came. But what had happened was... The pastor had made uh, 
had asked the police for permission for that week to up the noise a little bit. And they gave him in writing the permission. You can make noise. Well, these other folk there living in the street, they didn't know that the police had given permission. So they called the police to shut the meetings down and to grab the preacher and take him down, arrest his sorry donkey. Now, I was the preacher. So the police came and uh, they shut the meeting down temporarily. The pastor called the, the head of the country. By now, I'm standing by the police car. I was ready to go in. I'm being persecuted for Jesus. <laughs> anyway, the next thing you knew, the bishop showed up. How he got from his house to that church in that length of time, I don't know. And he told the police, you need to check your, uh, your files. We applied for a license for this service to go on and for the noise level to be a little above what it normally is. And uh, he pulled out the, the paper that the police had given him. And then the police told him, well, your neighbor, and they called the name of the person. And they were from another religious persuasion, but it's a church group that called the police on a church group. And the police said, oh, we're we excused, we're sorry, we didn't know you had permission. And they got back in the car and drove away. I didn't get to get arrested. <laughs> I'll be able to preach that. I got arrested for Jesus. Have you ever gotten arrested for Jesus? I bear in my body the marks of persecution. <laughs> the fact that I was a blessing to that man, whenever I came to that country, my gift made room. He couldn't say he didn't know me because he's got jewelry to prove that I know this guy. Every time he comes here, he's got something to give me. I can't let him get arrested. I'm going down there to stop it now because next year when he comes again, I'll get a bigger piece of jewelry. I don't know what his mentality was, but I think he did not want his guest preacher, that's me, to be arrested by the popo. Whenever you have an opportunity, give a gift. A gift makes space for you. It makes space in that person's heart. You'll be accepted and be a person that other people will rally around because they know that you will always be giving something. <laughs> I know that guy too. He has lost his mind. Whenever you have an opportunity, give a gift. I'm warning you. I'm telling you. I'm giving you some insight here. People don't remember people who don't give them anything. How many people give you nothing and you remember? You don't remember people who don't give you anything. But if somebody gives you something, you, you remember it. Huh? This thing was a gift. This apostle in gold, this was a gift to me. You think I forgot it? No, I remember those people. This here, this was not a gift to me. You think I forgot it? No, I remember those people. There are other people I don't remember them because they ain't giving nothing. <laughs> Hoo -wee. All right, let me get back to it now. Look. Whenever there is an opportunity, if it's a birthday, a wedding anniversary, somebody graduated from high school, somebody did well on something, they got first place in whatever, whenever there is an opportunity, give a gift. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> Number 18, mourn with people who are mourning. Mourn with people who are mourning. Times of sorrow are some of the most remembered times in people's lives. If you remember them during that period, they will never forget you. There are people that I know that have joined churches that I have pastored only because I went to the funeral. I went to the, the celebration of that person's life. I went to the wake. I went there. I didn't only go there with my two long hands swinging. I went there to represent the church, to let them know the church up the street, down the street, across town, is standing with you. If there is anything we can do, we will do it. And just in case they thought we were bluffing, we give them the envelope in their hand with something of substance to help them across in this funeral. And we did that a hundred times. I can't remember how many times we did that. The church is not just there to stretch out its hand during harvest time for people to give to them. We have always been a giving church. I have never pastored a church that was not a giving church. I insist on that. You've got to give. I don't like greedy people around me. Get away from me. 
your greedy spirit trying to get all up in my Kool-Aid and it doesn't know my flavor. The church must be a giving place. Mourn with people who are mourning. Mourn with people who are mourning. I went to this, uh, this, this wake one time. A woman's son had died and she was bawling. She was literally bawling. I walked up the stairs, knocked on the door, and this was not somebody that, uh, that was a friend of mine. This person had given me the length of their tongue. But, you know, people are hurting now. There's no time to bear grudge. I walk up that step. I knock on the door. The door opens. Who's it? It's pastor. Which pastor? And I walked in there. I said, hi, mommy. How are you doing? Said, I'm doing fine, my son. Well, I call her mommy. She called me son. And then she started crying again. You know what the Lord said? The Lord said she doesn't have the money for the funeral. That's why she's crying. She's crying more for the embarrassment of having no money than she's crying for her son. But she is crying for her son. But she's wondering in her tears, where is this money going to come from? So I walked up to her and said, listen to me and listen good. I said it nicer. I am a pastor of a church down the road, up the street, wherever. And um, we are going to take over this funeral. All of the expenses will be paid for by the church. Oh, you just blowing your trumpet. No. I'm just telling you, a lot of things, a lot of y'all cost the church. You don't know what the church does behind the scene because we don't talk about it. So I'm talking about it tonight. That we will take care of the funeral, the suit, the shoes, everything. And she stopped crying right away. She got up. She washed her face. And she looked at me in absolute shock. And she said, you know that time when I cussed you out? I said, yes, I never forget that. She said, I'm so sorry. I really misbehaved myself. Thank you. God bless you, my son. I said, okay. And then I came back later, sent one of the deacons with some stuff to make her happier. And we took care of the funeral from scratch to finish. The church did that. You don't know them stories. You cuss in the church, talking about the church always wants. You don't know what you're talking about. Not everybody's the same. I know a lot of churches, a lot of pastors that go the extra mile to help people out in their day of difficulty, in their time of funeral, in their time of sorrow, in their time of hurt, in their time when the, somebody's in the hospital. I know so many stories it, it, it will take. 10 years to tell them all. You be careful when you start rushing up to the church talking about the church is greedy and blah, blah. You don't know what happens behind the scenes. I got a hundred stories like that. A thousand stories like that. In different areas where the church was good to people. Oh yes, I know what I'm talking about. Mourn with people that mourn. Mourn with people that mourn. Mourn with people that mourn. Number 19. Go the extra mile to help people. Go the extra mile to help someone. Whenever you can help somebody in need, they will remember you. You will become a rallying point. People see when you make the extra effort and it touches their heart. When you ask them to rally around you for a cause, they will be there because they remember how you help them. If you sow a seed of help, you will get help. If you do not sow a seed of help, <laughs> you will not get help with your greedy self. Some people are like black holes. They take all the time. Point number 20. <clears throat> be friendly. Greet people in a pleasant way. Smile, laugh. When you come in a room, the room must lighten up. Because they know that you are a jolly person. That you are a friendly person. That you, you're ready with a quick laugh. You're not a sour puss. I don't know these people with their straight faces looking like, like the thunder god or something like that. And they call themselves a Christian. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Stop being a sour puss and souring up the place when you come around. Lighten the place. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor you will guide across the bar. Brighten the corner where you are. Yeah, brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Number 20. Be friendly. Greet people. Greet them in a pleasant way. Warmth is attractive. Give them a pat on the back or two. Shake their hand or shake their toes nowadays. You knock shoes like we do now. Social distancing and shake. Warmth is attractive. Warmth is attractive. Warmth is attractive. Warmth is attractive. I know some people that have tremendously uh, beautiful face, but they're not warm. And I know other people who are not endowed with that kind of a beauty, 
but they they have a warmth that is infectious. I would rather be around a warm person than Miss Universe who has acid in her facial expression. Warmth is attractive. A cold, crisp person is not a natural rallying point. You are what we call in school sour the hour. <laughs> <laughs> that one just came to mind. Number 21. Listen good. Be concerned when listening to people's problems. Don't only listen. Be concerned because tomorrow you may have a problem. This world is about problem. Man born of a woman is full of trouble. Full of trouble. That's the Bible now. So all of us will get trouble. When I'm in trouble, don't go telling everybody that I'm in trouble. Spreading the news like and people calling me from all over the world. I, uh, what about that incident with blah blah what so who told you that oh i don't want to say somebody has been talking every negative thing that they can tell they tell quick 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 if people would talk about jesus like they tell about the negative stuff that happened to you jesus would be the most popular man on the planet warmth is attractive not attached attractive a-t-t-r-a-c-t-i-v-e your phone is smart and it's trying to say another word. Warmth is attractive. Yes. Be concerned when you listen to people's problems. When listening to people's problems, your facial expression must show deep concern and interest. Try to pick up on the details and show that you're following the story. Being a pastor over the years, I can listen to five people at the same time and not, not break stride. And I know all the stories. I have the details. You just train yourself like that because sometimes... The time is going. Everybody's in a rush. You don't have the time to sit down for an hour with everybody. And you've got to listen to two stories. You're multitasking. Yes, yes. Be concerned when listening to people's problems. And then find out what you can do to assist, to help, to aid. we got to help one another in this life. Oh, yes. Final point. Number 22. <laughs> no wonder my wife tells me, but don't tell her I said so. You say you give the people too many points. Just give them five, six points and let the people go home. But I can make an excuse now. We have nowhere to go. COVID, COVID whatever, <laughs> has got us here and there's no going outside. 22, notice when people are not present. Notice when people are absent. Notice, call them up. Get somebody to call them up. Find out what's going on. People are offended when they find out you didn't even notice when they were away. How can they be important to you if you do not notice their absence? Sometimes I look at a church and I start calling names. I said, so-and-so and so is missing. So-and-so and so is absent. So-and-so and so is not here. Give them a call when you get home. Most times people don't bother with me because they don't know what you're trying to do. You're trying to get them to develop the ability and develop that thing in them to notice when people are absent. And some people absent themselves deliberately to see if anybody noticed that they are not there. Notice when people are absent. There are some people that are key to a service. Not the preacher, some people in the pew. There are some people, when they are present, you preach better because you know you can't bring any sloppy nonsense here. That person is a keen listener. You need people that are there that are bright and brighter than you so you don't say foolishness. That you come ready, you come prepared because you, you know the people have been battling all week with a rough boss and a rougher job. And they come to the house of God and they need to hear something proper. And for God's sake, Rev, prepare yourself and bring the thunder and lightning when you come. And notice when people are absent. Don't let two months go by and people are absent. You didn't call to find out what's going on. These 22 steps will make you a natural leader and a natural rallying point for people. Got that right. People are upset. They, they didn't see. They didn't know I was not here. Hi, Augustine. How are you doing, bro? God bless. I'm back home. I'm back in Canada. I'm in quarantine. Can you imagine my wife put me in quarantine? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's just the way it is. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. That people will incorporate some of these principles into their life. 
so that they can become a natural rallying point, like Jesus was. He attracted the audience because of his disposition and demeanor. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Cabo Shanda. I pray that our churches will become natural rallying points and that ministers who are guilty of partiality will stop it. I pray that we will notice when people are absent. That we will stop teasing people that don't like to be teased. That we will have a gift ready for certain occasions. That we will be a genuine listener and a blessing to people, to their families, to their homes, to their children, to their grandkids. We thank you that you are at work, that I will be done with this state of affairs in the world. Now, brethren, let me tell you something. <clears throat> There's a reset that's happening. There's a reset that's happening on the world scene. The Antichrist system the track has been laid and things are not going to slow down from here on in. It's going to speed up. You've got to get your heart right with God. You've got to stop this trivializing of church and the things of God. You've got to stop making those dumb excuses. <clears throat> I don't feel like going to church. I'm not in the mood. And da, 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 da. You know the excuses that you make. You've got to seriously consider that this is the world's last warning from the heavens and that we have got to take God seriously. This is not the time for trivializing and for making fun. God is calling. Yes, indeed. God is warning. Yes, indeed. We are going to see people with all kinds of dreams that God will speak to them through dreams and visions. Don't, don't, don't slap it away and call them false prophets. You're too quick. To judge people and to call them false prophets. You need to stop that. I'm telling you. There's a plan. To bring a one world government in place. And that plan. Is about to be executed. I'm telling you. That you're going to notice. The major churches. The major religions. Sitting and signing a deal. Where they will come together. It's going to happen in the Netherlands. If it doesn't happen this year. It's going to happen next year. Where the Pope. The Muslims and the, the other Catholics and those people will sit down together and sign this deal of a one world religion. It's coming and it's coming fast. I, you know, sometimes you warn people, they say you, you're a prophet of doom and don't, don't bring your gloom and doom because they don't get it. They think that things are going as it is. It's not going as it is. When this experiment is done, there are going to be more things coming to the world. And the church will be earmarked for persecution. 2020 is a year of preparation. Toughen yourself. Toughen yourself. You hear me? Toughen yourself. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Learn to fast and pray. Discipline yourself. If your prayer life is going to hell on a handbasket, tap into YouTube with people that pray for two hours and play the thing and pray along with them as you exercise, pray their prayer until your prayer kicks in. If you don't know where to find it, I'll send you one if you request one. But things are not going to go back as normal. Even when things go back to normal, they're not back to normal. There's a plan out there to put one man in charge of the whole world. And you can't buy nor sell unless you have his mark and his number. Okay, you got money now. Can you buy and sell? No, everybody's shut in. Everybody's locked away. In one week, the whole world is shut down. And you thought it was impossible for the Antichrist to make this thing happen? They have put every system in place. It's just the church that's holding them back from doing what they want to do. As long as the church is here, they know we will raise Cain and Abel. And so that they despise and they hate the church and plan every strategy how they can shut it down. They found a way finally how to shut it down. And I'm telling you, be very careful with your Christian walk. And for some of you, I need to tell you bluntly, stop playing these stupid games that you're playing with the house of God and the things of God. You need to stop. You need to stop it. 
these little experiments that you're running in the church. You need to stop it. You need to stop it. I'm warning you with all the warnings that I can warn. You need to stop these trivial, petty little games that you're playing with the church. You need to stop it. You need to get serious with the things of God and with the people of God. And some of you pastors watching me, you need to stop being threatened by people and you're trying to run them out of the church because you are afraid of their gift. You're like King Saul. You have King Saul's anointing on you and anybody that you think is too bright, you're ready to run them off. Stop it. God has sent people to us as agents of assistance. And we need to stop trying to get rid of people. All right, Sunshine Alim. I'm going to get that message across to you. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and grant you his peace in the name of Christ's Son. Amen. Have a good night. Have a great day. God bless. The boom is out.